Uh, Helen Adhow has worked for 35 years to connect farming, food systems, land stewardship, and conservation. She farmed and conducted research at Woodleaf Farm in Eastern Oregon until spring 2023 when she moved to Western Montana. Her on-farm research includes ecological weed and insect management, organic minimum soil disturbance systems for vegetable and orchard crops, and managing live mulches for soil and habitat building. She is a contributing writer to the Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Pest and Disease Control and other books. She has served as a board member for the Organic Farming Research Foundation and advisor for the Wild Farm Alliance. Adhau has a master's degree in horticulture from Rutgers University and has worked in education and research at the University of Arkansas, Rutgers University, the, and Oregon State University, and served as a horticulture, horticulture extension agent in Montana, where she annually taught an organic master gardener course. Whew. You're an impressive lady. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> All right, so everybody, please welcome Helen. I'm going to kick it off to her. What a joy to be back in Missoula. And in fact, all of my research and science and any of the writing that ever has come out of this started in that library over there, where my mother taught me about truth. When I was at Paxson, I was supposed to do a, a, an essay or a, a, a report on Yugoslavia. And I said, well, I'll just go and get the Encyclopedia Britannica now. She said, no, let's go to the library and let's get at least five books. And I got five books and I read through them and I said, but they don't agree. And mom said, yes. And that's truth. So for 40 years, I've been playing with organic farming and horticulture and ecology and trying to come up with truth and things that work for farmers and for us, as we try to take care of the planet and the world, and you know what? It's not simple. Truth is not simple. And it turns out that ecology, as well as farming, is both beautiful and messy. And it's not simple. It's complex. I could not even come up with a simple, pithy title, for God's sake. So the book is full of... Uh, a story of three farms, but also a lot of very nerdy detail. So, but the last part of the book, the second part of the book, is basically a 20 years later organic master gardener manual as I would have done it now with all the experience and the literature review that I've done. So. There you have it. I'm going to go through the, the beauty and the mess, messiness of ecology using three farms, uh, the farms that I've been involved with. And I could talk about all the nerdy detail in the book, and we could be here for hours, or we could just focus maybe on a little bit of it. I think maybe you'd like that since it's a sunny day outside. So I want to talk about balancing healthy food, healthy farms, healthy soil, and healthy environments. And of course, we also want to produce food because we want to eat this beautiful stuff, don't we? It, it's kind of hard to, to put ourselves in the middle of these, these wild systems. But what I mean by healthy farms is both soil and habitat building. And what I mean by habitat building is creating space for what I like to call our free ecosystem providers, biological control organisms. And I'll talk quite a bit more about that and show you lots of pictures because even though we're at a writer's conference, I still believe that pictures are really worth a thousand words. So, soil and habitat building, and I get more detailed because the details matter. So healthy farms to me mean that we have minimal off-farm inputs and minimal soil disturbance, natural nutrient cycling and recycling like in natural ecosystems, and year-round growing roots. I think that's the magic, the keeping a root in the soil, and hence not tilling, disturbing the soil all up. And those growing roots provide habitat for both soil microorganisms or the soil food web and biological control organisms. The, the organisms that suppress 
the diseases and the insects and anything that is problematic to our plants. Healthy foods. A lot of words lately, a lot of uh, people talking about food as medicine, subscription food. I think, I think we're in a teachable moment for this now. And through the research that my late husband and I did, we found that our year-round soil cover and grow our own fertilizer system resulted in high mineral, vitamin, and antioxidant-rich produce. And when I say year-round soil cover, this is our farm in Oregon. And you can see that there's very little bare soil in the middle of the growing season for both our orchard and for our vegetable farm. And in fact, it's kind of mimicking, mimicking that natural, the natural riparian system and the, the uh, area around us that was native. All right. So here's some research that we did uh, on the farm in California, the first woodleaf farm in the Sierra foothills of California. And we basically compared uh, O. Henry peach tissue from our peaches and two other organic farmers that were long-term organic farmers at Bay Area Farmers Markets. And we found that with our system, we had higher manganese, boron, and zinc in our fruit. And we started looking at, at other nutrients, but this is uh, one that I wanted to show you. And in fact... We've also found, and other researchers have, researchers have found, that low nitrogen, high carbon farm-grown fertilizer results in deeply colored. And that's really important. You know how they say, eat a rainbow? Deeply colored fruit has higher antioxidants that protect it naturally from insects and diseases and makes it no, more nutritious for humans. So... In one study, lower peach tissue nitrogen increased both vitamin C content and resistance to brown rot. Isn't that a wonderful synergy? That vitamin C, which we'd like too, makes it more nutritious and food is medicine, also helped protect that, that fruit, that peach fruit, from a disease that is probably the number one disease of peach fruit in, well, in the world, but certainly in our part of the world. So, hmm, ecology, multitasking, interesting. And then finally, healthy, healthy environment. And this gets down to the crux of the issue. How do we feed ourselves? How do we feed ourselves well? How do we have food as medicine without destroying the homes of other organisms with whom we share the planet? Do you guys worry about this? I know someone in the back there definitely worries about it because he used to call my Stevensville, Montana farm a sacrifice zone for wildlife. And it's just given me a hard time about putting up an eight-foot deer fence around my new farm in Hamilton because I'm, I'm minimizing elk habitat. I'm actually keeping the elk out of that part. Whew. And Grant, I haven't even told you about the little very cute bear cub that was in my gate last night. Oh, God. <laughs> the puppy bear I wanted to keep. <laughs> and there are stories, all of these guys. There's a story for the tree frog and the lettuce. And, and oh, that yellow warbler in the peaches and the apples in the orchard. I could tell you stories about him and the pygmy owl and the coyote. That's in Stevensville. And then the cougar big stories about the cougar who lived with us for longer than I would have liked in the walnut tree, whom I named Clytemestra. And the reason that we think about healthy environments is because in the very act of farming, we can destroy environments. We can destroy habitat. Mining for plant minerals and over-fertilizing destroys habitat. My late husband and I worked really hard to grow our own fertilizer because we began to feel that it was very unfair to be mining somebody else's land to be getting the fertilizers to produce our food. So could we, could we do that differently? 
And, and yes, we could. And nitrogen, when I first started my farming, which was actually back east, and then in, in Stevensville in the 1980s, I was a nitrogen hoarder. And in fact, I am a recovering nitrogen hoarder. At the moment, I still still think about that. But it took many, many years to get over using too much nitrogen because when you do use nitrogen, your plants and your crops grow vigorously and green. But you can also get fertilizer runoff, even manure, even cover crops or green manures tilled into the soil. You can get leaching of nitrogen into surface water. So can we... Can we Avoid that. And the other thing that, of course, is happening in our world, and I promise I'm going to get really positive here in a minute, is that we're losing many of the organisms that have been on this planet. 40% of all insect species are declining globally. Terrestrial insects are declining at a rate of 9%, and freshwater insects at 11% per year. And that's indirectly, that's all of us. That's not just farming. But farming, we're losing our topsoil by our tillage. So 2 billion tons of U.S. soil are lost to soil erosion, er, erosion every year. And soil organic matter levels have decreased by 50% since the 1930s. That's our magic. That's our soil organic matter is where the microorganisms, the soil food web live. And we're losing that. So we want to think about ecological farming because the way we've been doing it has not improved our environmental health, our soil health, and even, I dare say, our farm and human health. So what does ecological farming look like? What my late husband and I decided is that instead of managing just crops, just our tomatoes, just our peaches, thinking about our yields, we wanted to think about overlapping ecological principles. So all of the messiness I talked about, all of the things that are going on in an ecosystem are going on on a farm if we allow ourselves to think about mimicking natural systems. And, and we want to think about multitasking, so not just thinking about building soil, but also building soil and habitat for Anybody recognize that beautiful creature on the peach? Who is he? Praying mantis. Isn't he gorgeous? And, and here's the apples in our orchard. And, and do you see any bare soil? No. Even when we're harvesting, it's looking pretty wild. So it took us a long time to get here. We didn't just start figuring out how to manage overlapping ecological principles. It took us about 35 years to evolve our soil and habitat building systems based on managing ecological relationships. So there's my farm. I started in the 1990s in Stevensville. There's St. Mary's. And there's my farm with uh, what I call living mulches in between the crop rows. So I don't have bare soil and I have those living roots. And those are legumes. And then, while I was doing that, my husband-to-be was doing the same thing, started a decade earlier than I, in the Sierra foothills of California, using grass legume weed living mulches. By the time I met him, he wasn't even measuring nitrogen in his soil and, and thought I needed to be a little more brave and stop worrying so much about nitrogen. So... That's, those are two of the three farms. I said this was a tale of three farms. Those are the two and the learning process, the learning curve. I'm not going to have time to talk about all my mistakes, darn it, here today. <laughs> uh, but I put them all in the book. So the first things we started to do, both of us, before we knew one another, is we began to eliminate most tillage and most off-farm materials and mined minerals to make compost and apply as fertilizers, and we both stopped using manures. 
So here's the third farm in the tale of three farms. We uh, we did very well uh, when I finally sold my farm in Cali or in Stevensville, Montana, and I moved to California. And uh, we uh, we we made enough money that we could semi-retire to 200 acres in Eastern Oregon. And of course, first thing we did was plant an orchard because who can live without lots of fruit, right? Can any of you? No. So we had um, uh, we had this orchard, and we. We're going to really push the ecological boundaries and perennial uh, uh, fruit crops in a no-till orchard. And again, we had a hay field, and we planted into the hay field, so whatever was there, grass, legume, weed, became the living mulch. It's amazing how the weeds came in for free and just gave us all this diversity. So in the no-till orchard, we're trying to mimic natural systems, no off-farm fertilizer. Think about that. Those peach trees have had no off-farm nitrogen for eight years. Isn't that incredible? It is incredible. Uh, take it from me as a, as a farmer. No weeding and no insect or disease sprays. Even in California, we had started not spraying most of our tree fruit crops with even certified organic materials. Now with the vegetables, we couldn't get away with no-till. The annuals were a little more picky. They didn't have those deep roots that the fruit trees had, and they found those, those living mulches could be a little competitive with them. And you know, we haven't learned to make annuals share their root system area as well as the trees. Um, but I'm still hopeful. So what we did was crop row only strip tillage in the spring with no-till perennial living mulches in between the crops for the vegetable production. But still, no off-farm fertilizer. The fertilizer comes from this mowed living mulch blown into the crop rows and slowly over time decomposing and providing the nutrients that the plants need. And I talk in detail about how to do this in the book because the details matter. It's not as, remember I said ecology can be messy. It's not as simple as we would like it to be, but it is totally possible. This talk is showing the possibilities. So, the no-till living mulches provide both natural nutrient cycling when the living mulches are mowed and habitat for soil and leaf microbes. So we know about soil microbes. There's also this whole ecology of microorganisms on the leaf. And if we stop spraying things, they flourish and we get biologic, biological control of diseases from this ecological realm as well as all of the biological control organisms in the soil. So soil and leaf microbes, beneficial insects, birds, reptiles, and others of those free ecosystem providers I was talking about. So our data was really good uh, over the long term, and if you do something for long enough, you can actually make enough mistakes to learn something. We found that on the farm in California, that the average soil organic matter increased from about 2% in 1989 to over 5% as an average, and in some fields, up to 6%. So the system was working to make the soil better. On the Oregon farm over eight years, we saw uh, wonderfully improved soil health, increased soil organic matter, or what I'm calling soil carbon, and excellent soil microbial diversity and abundance. So all of those microorganisms, the soil food web, were increasing at, at a, a very rapid rate. And in fact, our total microbial biomass, or the total number of microorganisms in that soil, were rated by, by, uh, by the soil testing lab as, as in the excellent range including, very exciting, we found an increase in fungi, including mycorrhizae. How many have heard about mycorrhizae? Okay, not as many of you as I would have thought. Okay, mycorrhizae 
Remember when that article in Science came out and they talked about how trees were communicating? Mycorrhizae were helping them communicate. They, they're fungi that associate with the roots and then they put their little, it's mycelium, I can't think of a good analogy, their little web-like fiber optic system into the soil and they not only communicate, the, but they bring in nutrients from farther out than the roots can reach and they help plants to be more self-sufficient. So mycorrhizae are really important in natural systems, but they diminish completely in tilled system. So bringing them back into an agricultural system was very exciting to me and protozoans, which, you know, not very many people are as excited as I am about protozoans, but they increase decomposition rates. They help break plant residues down, and that's how we can get to grow our own fertilizers if we have these guys that will help us break it down and make it available, cycle it through to plants. All right. So that's the soil side. But remember, we're multitasking. We're building soil with some of the same things that we're doing that then will increase habitat to increase the biological organisms, but also wildlife. So here are some of the, the diversity of, of wildlife and biological control organisms at Woodley Farm. We've got a surfid fly, and they like to eat the pest insects, the bad guy insects. We've got a robin in a nectarine tree. This guy is an assassin bug, and you can imagine what he does for insects. And here we have a garter snake going through the, the Brussels sprouts, not something that you're always happy to find uh, when you're picking your Brussels sprouts, but, but a very important biological control. And birds, there's a guy eating a worm that we'd rather not find in our crops. So basically what we have been trying to do the last 15, 20 years is to think about strengthening the whole immune system of our agroecosystem. So habitat building as well as soil building, making sure our plants, we shift the balance to our plants, but we also allow the other organisms to be part of the agroecosystem. So habitat building and pest suppression within our systems and spiders are a big important part and they don't like to be disturbed by tillager or mowing or weeding. And the reason that this is important to us is that it is very clear as ecologists and in farmers that when we kill something in the system, we take over its job. And then we have to apply pesticides, mine fertilizers, make lots of compost and apply it. We have to inherit the jobs of the organisms that we kill off. So that's why the living mulches, because we're trying to create habitat as close to the crop as we can for these parasitic flies and snakes and spiders who are eating aphids on cabbage. And what we found over the years is that this increase in habitat meant increased predators and parasites, and so we were able to stop spraying even the certified organic materials by, by 2000. And still, we're getting uh, lovely yields, or we were getting lovely yields on the Oregon farm. We'll see what happens now on the, the new place in Montana with still no pest sprays. And in fact, of course, I told you there were nerdy details. We looked at who was giving us this biological control and we found that it was both ground dwelling predators like lady beetles and spiders and carabid beetles and rove beetles, all these guys that live in the soil. So if you disturb the soil, what happens to them, you think? 
Yeah, they're gone, exactly. And particularly the spiders. And I'm realizing over the last uh, 15 or 20 years how important the spiders are to effective biological control. In fact, I'm not going to do it here, but I have a pinup calendar of all my 12 favorite spiders by each month. Predators and parasites, too. These are the guys above ground. And what they need is pollen and nectar all the time. It turns out they don't just like to eat for a few months, few weeks out of the year when certain things are blooming. It turns out they want to eat all year. Who, who knew? So sequential pollen and nectar, sequential bloom period, not just one species of flowering plant, but a diversity so that you have bloom throughout the season. For things like the surfed fly, soldier beetle, another assassin bug. And these are parasitic wasps, and parasites basically land on the insect that's a pest, say a cabbage worm, that we hate to find in our broccoli and cabbage, and then they lay eggs and they hatch and eat their way out like invasion of the body snatchers. And then what we found was creating habitat, having this diversity of insects, allowed us to have earlier and increased numbers of predators and parasites so there was no lag time between when the pests show up and when the predators move in because that's when biological control doesn't work, is when there's that lag time. And you know what else we found? Increased habitat, increased other organisms. I was kind of an entomologist, so I first started studying the insects, but birds moved in, and they would eat things like cabbage worms. Do you see what's in that bluebird's mouth? It's a cabbage worm. And so we started measuring, of course we did, the birds at Woodleaf Farm, and we got some uh, uh, ornithologists from uh, UC Davis to come and help us, and it turned out that we were able to create, again, a great diversity of birds, and they were helping us with quite a bit of biological control. Remember I was telling you about that uh, yellow warbler? Well. That's a male yellow warbler in a peach tree. Here are his babies in a pluot tree nearby. And I've never seen such hardworking birds. And they were going for codling moths and oriental fruit moth. Um, they were going for all of the worms that you usually find inside apples and peaches. And so what we found is that as we stop spraying even the certified organic insecticides, as we stopped having things on leaves, as we created habitat and left it wild and a little messy, the birds began to nest in the orchard in great diversity and great numbers, and the pests in our orchard decrease, hence why we could stop spraying. And this was kind of exciting because, you know, traditionally birds had been a problem in cherries, but we began to find that even in cherries, we had no serious fruit damage from the spring nesting birds, the ones that would nest in our cherries about bloom and about the time the first cherries were uh, forming. Because generally, nesting birds tend to be insectivorous, which means that they eat a diet of mainly insects. And some birds just stay eating insects, but other birds start moving to fruit, but not till after the babies are gone. They want that high protein insect diet. So we can work around having birds in the orchard, it turns out. And of course, some birds were around at different times, and here's our wild turkeys. We had a herd of 50 of them in uh, the Oregon farm, and they're basically uh, the clean cleanup crew and would help us to get rid of any diseased fruit that had fallen on the ground. Another lovely synergy. So, basically, uh, to summarize, I, I kind of want to say that what we've noticed over the last 20, 25 years of, of moving towards this managing ecological relationships rather than just crops for the highest yield that we can get is that we have system resilience. Has anybody noticed that it's been hotter the last year or two? 
and drier. Well, maybe not this year here, but uh, in Oregon in 21 and 22, it was unbelievably dry and hot. And we were still able to get good yields when other people were having problems. The system has great resiliency, turns out, when you work with ecology. So... Do we know all the answers? Do I have all the answers in the book? No. But I started a new farm, and I know this is where all the, new, the answers are going to come from. No, seriously. Seriously. It continues on different soils, different climates. But I'm really excited by how well the fruit trees, the pluots, the peaches, and the nectarines, yes, I know, but I'm trying, in, in Hamilton are growing, and uh, how well the soil is doing in the high tunnel. So, working with ecology is, is an ongoing process, but we're going to continue. And maybe we'll have you guys writing books later on with some more results. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, I know you people have a lot of questions, probably, but before we do that, I want to... Oh, do you have a question? Oh. oh. Well, well, I was going to have you guys now talk about your thing, and then we could all do questions together. Right. So I'm going to leave it now to Mary Pat and to Winnie to talk about the Anaconda Community Foundation and their Melting Pot Cookbook. Now that we've all learned how to grow the best food, what are we going to do with it? Right. I'll hand you this you microphone. You guys can share. Okay. okay. Oh, Winnie, well, this is quite a transition. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess I would... Who is medicine? You see Winnie now? <laughs> and Mary Pat. <laughs> My plan. Yeah, as I was saying, it's quite a transition, but maybe instead of saying what is old is new, is what is new is old. Mm -mm. And <laughs> our folks that were the characters in this melting pot cookbook were most... We wanted to capture... The immigrant story uh, of all the folks who moved to Anaconda, mostly from Europe. And of course, when they came, I'm sure they planted gardens. Uh, we have more of a challenge in Anaconda. <laughs> We're at 5,500 feet, and you know, we can grow uh, cabbage, onions, carrots easily. Rhubarb. Rhubarb. And there, and yeah, several rhubarb recipes in this cookbook <laughs> as a result of that. But um, I guess we're getting a little off the track of our cookbook. But you know, it, it all comes together, doesn't it? And we know they had to have gardens when uh, people arrived from the old country. So I guess we'll talk about a little about why we did this book and how it came around and our goal. We'll start with the goal. Okay. Our goal in creating Anaconda's Melting Pot Cookbook was to honor and preserve Anaconda's rich culinary heritage by bringing together recipes from each of the ethnic groups that settled into our smelting town. Yet as we reviewed the stories that came with the recipes, we realized that from wherever in the world the recipe came, the key element was not geographical location. The crucial ingredients were the love that went into the preparation of the dish and the joy that came from sharing delicious food. As the project progressed, we started out with a much different um, concept in the beginning. But as we gathered the recipes from the wonderful families in Anaconda that shared them with us, and we also asked for stories, and that was really a lot of the fun here. But <clears throat> we soon found that I'll, I'll just read this. Recipes evoke vivid memories of aromas drifting out of the kitchen, the people who prepared the dish, and specific family gatherings. They remind us of our home, our parents, and grandparents. That always chokes me up a little. <laughs> and the caring and love that went into the preparation of our favorite foods. We pay tribute to Anaconda's melting pot of cultures, but we also honor the individual family members who created the dishes we hold so dearly in our memories. <clears throat> so we thanked everyone who shared their family recipes and heartwarming stories. 
and the Anaconda Melting Pot Cookbook celebrates your legacy of love. Goose Town? Should we go right to Goose Town? Um, what is Goose Town? Yeah. <laughs> There's an area in Anaconda known as Goose Town. It's in the eastern part of the city, uh, close to the smelter, is where a lot of the immigrants settled when they came to town. And uh, uh, as we learned, a lot of the immigrants from Croatia would, of course, settle in an area with other people from Croatia. Or people from Italy would be in the Italian section. Um, or Yugoslavia <laughs> uh, would be in that section. They So they would retain their language and their culture and their celebrations. And of course, celebrations center around food. But um, Goose Town is the area in which a lot of the folks settled before the western part of the city was developed. And um, everybody asks, how did that area get its name? So there is a little story in our book, there, okay, um, that was written by Sally Campbell, who was an editor of our local newspaper, the Magic Land Times, in 1974. And this was her article. Part of her article. In the 1890s, a tall, handsome, she was quite superfluous, or, yeah, very, <laughs> what's a <the> word? <laughs> she used a lot of adjectives. <laughs> in the 1890s, a tall, handsome man, about 18 years, arrived in the country from Slovenia, which is a northern state in Yugoslavia. His name was Frank Petlin, and he was a man for adventure. Shortly after arriving in Anaconda, he went to Alaska for another adventure, but then he returned to Anaconda, and together with a man named John Plute, established the P&P &P Saloon at the, color, or the corner of Alder and 3rd Street, which is in Goosetown. Workers at the smelter traveled to and from work via the streetcar that traversed 3rd. Uh, so beginning at Chestnut Street, there was a bar on each corner for five consecutive blocks with a and p having the center location. Now the P&P &P Saloon building was a church that had been moved from the town center. And not long after it opened for business, Petland bought out his partner. The five bars marking street car stops in Goose Town sponsored raffles. And lucky winners received a live goose or a turkey from the flocks kept in the back of the saloon. So um, often smeltermen, after having a tough day on the smelter, would stop at one of those saloons and um, b refresh himself with a beer, a shot and a beer, as we say. Um, but he could, he didn't want to go empty handed after he stopped for the shot and the beer, so he could get a goose from one of the pens in the back of the saloons. There was no refrigeration, so fowl were kept in backyards until the joyous holiday when it was plucked Plucked, this is, better be careful, yeah. <laughs> Plucked, clucked, and plattered. The geese and turkeys were acquired for the most part from Petland's grandfather who lived in Twin Bridges. So that's just a story about Goose Town. The folks who would, the, or the smeltermen who would be on the tram and stop for their fowl to go home with. So we were thinking it was sort of like tavern to table. <laughs> Uh, one of the pleasures of putting this book together was gathering the stories from our local people. And that wasn't always easy. Yeah, I'll get that to you. Uh-huh, we'll get that to you. We'll get that to you. But um, the book reads, um, I mean, it's fun to read because we tried to include a lot of those stories in with the recipes. The recipes are grand as well, but the stories are sometimes pretty entertaining and Winnie and I had a lot of great laughs. I'll share one of them with you now. My Swedish grandmother, Ellen Nord Hammond, moved to the United States in the late 1800s and met my grandfather, Arthur Hammond, at a sanatorium in Idaho. He was a cook and she was a housekeeper for a doctor. Grandpa became an outfitter and camp cook for many. Am I reading the right one? Yeah, date not read, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, here we are. Here we are. All right. Um, and camp cook for the other outfitters. The family lived near Jackson Hole, Wyoming for many years. 
When my mom was a teenager, Grandpa moved the family to Anaconda and went to work at the smelter so his daughter would not marry a cowboy. Gra Grandma Ellen made this recipe for her family, but my sister Ellen Strumman has revised the procedure to make a unique and popular date nut bread. So he moved his family from Wyoming to Montana to avoid cowboys. Yeah. Yeah. But then she found a smelterman. Yeah. <laughs> Who brought geese home. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Um, another story that came from actually talking to this gentleman at Art in the Park. And his daughter-in-law was kind enough to get this recipe for sarma to us, which is, uh, you know, you combine sauerkraut and ground beef and roll it up in a cabbage leaf and then roast it. So here is the story. My grandparents, from, from this elderly gentleman, Floyd Collins, who was worked on the railroad, my grandparents lived at 518 East 3rd across from the Cali Heist Bakery. Grandpa was a Hungarian and grandma was Slovenian. When they got married, neither one spoke the other's language. <laughs> but, so that was the story of his grandparents. One of my favorite meals at their house was Sarma. Grandma made it with meat from the Metropolitan Meat Market. So one of the, one of the items we dug up was an ad from the Metropolitan Meat Market from 1936. So we, we, besides stories and besides recipes, we tried to bring together photos, um, you know, memorabilia like old ads and so it's it's not just a cookbook it's full of heartwarming stories and historical photos we have a couple more stories well i'll read them a little bit about um, bar town anaconda was kind of a bar town maybe still is <laughs> well, they have that hard work they, yeah. yeah anaconda had bars in tents before it had frame buildings <laughs> Anacondans kept their national traditions by establishing bars that became ethnic and neighborhood hangouts. Prohibition in the 1920s and 1930s did not affect alcohol consumption. Large numbers of Anacondans manufactured and sold illegal alcohol. That's really hard to believe, Winnie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next to smelting copper, illegal manufacture of booze from 1919 to 1933 was the town's second leading industry. <laughs> uh, Anaconda's melting pot cookbook would be remiss if its pages did not include drink recipes. It's history now, but it's appropriate to mention certain drinks that were history makers years ago. Uh, also, one of the things we ran into when we requested recipes were people said, my, my, my grandmother never wrote anything down. I mean, you just had to watch them create whatever they were going to create because they didn't share what they were going to, I mean, they just did it automatically. So this is a story about somebody who tried to recreate their grandmother's recipe. Grandma Mary Candidge made making bread and donuts difficult because she did not use measurements. So the recipe came from memory. I asked if grandma would teach me and I went to grandma's house and watched closely guessing how much of each ingredient she used. Then she would go home and make it and take it back to grandma. Grandma would taste it and tell me what I did wrong. So the recipe that this woman um, submitted was the recipe that she had tried over and over again to get right for grandma. One of the fun things we discovered when we were pulling all this together was, although um, they came from many, many different com countries, the recipes were very similar. You know, the cookies were butter and flour and sugar, but they all had different names. Same with some of the um, entree-type foods. Mm -hmm. It was, well, look, this is the same. Do we have this confused? And so it was really educational for us. It was. I was, I was thinking of the other, we have another recipe for minestrone soup and a steak casserole. And the ingredients are soup bone, onion, <laughs> and some carrots. But, uh, whatever they had in the cabbage. refrigerator. So th that was part of it. It might be whatever you, you, you might have had in the refrigerator. That was, another, oh, and then there was that mulligan stew. <laughs> Here, yeah, the mulligan stew. And... Um, it was taken from an AOH, which is the Ancient Order of Hibernians Auxiliary Cookbook. Um, and 
it said there were times that were often tough in Anaconda Company strikes. And I, I think that was early on and also in the time that we grew up. But large families were challenged by the food budget. And one solution was Mulligan stew. Everything left in the icebox and garden would provide a healthy, satisfying meal. So, you know, whatever was out there, you could just bring in, put it in the pot. Um, the picture we chose for the front of the cookbook, <clears throat> we all love. And the recipe that accompanies that picture is called Goose Town Donuts. Whenever these donuts were being made down on Ash Street, every kid in the neighborhood would show up at the kitchen door to sneak a few donut holes. This recipe is from Francis Hafey and Lucy McNellis. I remember seeing our kitchen table filled with donut holes ready for the neighborhood kids to devour. There were a lot of great cooks in Goose Town, and most of the recipes like this one were shared. Oh, and I did find one of those recipes. If you wanted to make this casserole, you get a round steaks of flour, Parmesan cheese, cooking oil, tomato sauce, salt and pepper, seasoned salt, Worcestershire salt, Worcestershire sauce, <laughs> something like that. Um, onions, mushrooms, and cheese. And then mix it together. And the remark was the, the amount could vary because you had no idea who would, how many kids would show up for dinner. So that's our book. I was, there's one more example. Um, you know, I think we mentioned at the beginning, people settled in their own ethnic neighborhoods, but later on there was no way all these delicious recipes wouldn't work out into the mainstream. And um, we have a very active ancient order of Hibernian ladies group who every year have a dinner to raise scholarships. And so what do they serve? Yugoslavian Sarma. It, they prepare and serve this Eastern European specialty of cabbage rolls and sauerkraut to raise money for scholarships. Gastronomic diplomacy at its most enjoyable. It's funny you mention, you know, people not knowing exactly how their grandmothers did it. My own mother, who is an immigrant from Sweden, she is an amazing cook. And I swear, she opens her refrigerator and where all I see is like mustard and mayonnaise and like some sprigs of lettuce, she can make a five course meal. And one of her, she makes these amazing saffron runs every year for Christmas. And I asked her the recipe and she sent it to me. And the very first step was melt the butter. And I went back and I looked at the ingredients list and nowhere on there was butter. <laughs> and I said, mom, how much butter? And she said, just, I don't know, just melt some butter. I don't, what? And, I, and it was like a whole stick and a half that you needed. It was, you know, it was a huge, anyway. So thank you. So that I, I have a copy at home and I've been flipping through it and you all have to get yourself. There's, you even have some where the recipe has changed a little over the years. I think there's one, is it? sisters um, added to the sauce. Yeah. So it was like in 1968, it was this, but then in 1970, it was this. And, you know, it was it was really lovely. The Copper Club restaurant, which was very famous over there, had a 1946 recipe for their sauce in the 1970. Yes, that okay. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, it was great, great. Okay, well, I want to open it up to questions. If everyone has questions for any of our three lovely panelists, yeah, here I'll give you your microphone back. Well, oh, I um was just curious about whether you brought those, did you transport those predators in or were they already there, like the assassinates and the ladybugs? And do you bring them in like a... No, that's they, the beauty of this. Like create, <laughs> create habitat and they will come. They will come. Yeah. So she asked if we brought them in. No. But you know what's kind of exciting? Where we lived in eastern Oregon, it had been a big fruit area and then uh, kind of died out in the 1950s when the cannery burnt down and uh, had gone straight to ranching. But they had brought in all of these um, praying mantises in the 30s and they were still everywhere. And apparently they nested on some of my um, row covers, you know, for putting over... And so I am now bringing, bringing by accident, I brought egg cases of late praying mantises to Hamilton. So we'll see what happens. Did you bring any 
No, Molly, of course not. She asked if I brought slugs, and of course not. I don't know. I hope not. What do you think about bringing ladybugs into it? Uh, well, here's the thing. They're, these organisms are just like us. If you have the things that they want, they want shelter, they want water, they want uh, the adults, uh, want the, the predator I mean, want the pest to eat, but they also want an alternative source to eat. If the, if the aphids, for example, aren't there, they want, they want thrips. So if you have the habitat that will keep them happy, they'll stay. But if ladybugs aren't happy, they will head to the mountains. Create habitat and they will come. Create habitat and then bring them in. Um, I vote I love history and I love cooking but I also love the camaraderie that exists around the table when you enjoy what you've created in the kitchen um, so I guess initially it was to to preserve and honor all that great ethnic history and all those great ethnic dishes but the ethnic celebrations uh, that the groups enjoyed and when these uh, when the different stories started to come in it was like these people also loved that camaraderie around the table or the camaraderie in the kitchen between grandmothers and granddaughters uh, with the grandmothers passing on that wonderful Christmas cookie recipe and uh, they would hang out together so that was that was just more impetus to do it because there were these wonderful stories and I al already wanted to do the history and the celebrating the ethnic groups but then this heartfelt part came in and that was even more beautiful so the cookbook just evolved um, with more ideas that came in and the rest of the story is we adore the Anaconda Community Foundation and we we see the wonderful work they do and this was a five-year project, um, like every Monday. Mondays now go by, and I think I'm missing a meeting. I've got to go to a meeting. Um, but we're so proud to do this work for the Anaconda Community Foundation because they do such fine work. And so it was a win-win as far as I'm concerned. I just want to make, this is more a comment than a question, because both these, uh, of course, I'm an Anaconda. <laughs> uh, She's a plant. But what I want to bring into this is that one of the things that's happened in Anaconda, of course everybody in the room knows it's a super fun site, and that to grow things in the soil has been a difficult thing. I have not seen, when I moved here I didn't see gardens. Rhubarb, yes. <laughs> okay, but what I've seen over the years is and one thing that impacted me personally there, which brings your presentation just front and center for me, is um, you had a choice and have a choice now in Anaconda to um, have your yards reclamated. And with this, if you did participate in it, they provided a four by eight foot raised garden, brought in soil for us, and for the first time in the 27 years I lived there, I was able to have a small garden. And um, it's, it's just been a really wonderful, beautiful thing in my trial and error. I plant petunias with my carrots, I'm sorry. And it's beautiful, it's just gorgeous. I love how my garden looks, and I'm learning every year from the states and all. Um, but to hear your presentation just gets me so excited about that and uh, um, also you know I'm so grateful that um, within this horrific thing of reclaiming um, Anaconda for um, uh, the Superfund site it's it's just really um, a positive experience. We have I have three or four friends there in the last ten years who started beekeeping including Mary Pat and um, they they uh, uh, redone the hilt 
time I'm seeing green hills, of course green hills too, but and there's so many exciting things to go with soil reclamation and um, with um, you know us having the opportunity to do our own backyard gardening again, not just in pots but in raised beds. So thank you to both of you. It's just exciting to <laughs> That's really wonderful. I, I, I wanted to say there's some really exciting new research the last few years looking at those microorganisms I was talking about and, and certain fungi particularly that can reclaim heavy metals and can help plants grow. And then you grow the plants, you cut them, and you don't use them for fertilizer. You kind of put them somewhere else because they've pulled out the heavy metals in combination with the microorganisms. So, you know, uh, growing certain uh, certain fungi that then can produce mushrooms, too. Um, come and do a talk in our well, we can do that. Yeah, we'll we can do that. that. We'll that. You know, so much of what you talked about was obviously your large-scale farms, and I have a 15 by 15. Did you see my, my backyard in the new Hamilton place? With the, with the, you know, 100 by 100 with peaches and pluots and nectarines? <laughs> well, yeah, but for, for a raised bed garden thing, yeah. you know, so much where you're, like, I'm, I'm intrigued about how your book addresses those small-scale <sighs> home gardens. Uh, it does. Um, to be honest, it's it's a, a little bit larger usually, but you can do cover crops or living mulches in between your raised beds. You can use those living mulches that you're stepping on. You can also cut them and put them on your raised beds in the fall when you put them to bed. You can over sow your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, your tomatoes in August with, uh, with a, a, a clover, an annual clover that will grow for a while. And then here, usually pre-climate change, uh, would, would, uh, would winter kill. And then you'd have the soil covered with a living mulch that then dies naturally. And I'm going to say that, see, these are some of the decisions that we make, but if you have enough room to have one raised bed that you grow habitat and fertilizer in, and then maybe that's a late crop or an early spring crop for the next year, you can grow beautiful crimson clover in it. It'll have these gorgeous, you know, two inch long red flowers. And then you let everybody use it as part of your sequential pollen and nectar, then you cut it, the fertilizer is there and for that bed, but you take what you cut and you put it in another bed and mulch it. So if you're willing to give up a little space, you, I think you can use some of these techniques. Oh, we went right up to time. Does anybody have any, any other questions? I thought there was a question here. Well, yeah, I was going to make a comment. Um, I grew up in Butte, next door to Butte. I was thinking about Butte when they were talking. And um, after my mom died, I got all of her cookbooks. And, you know, they're just in tatters. And so I wanted to make pomatitsa. So I tried to make oh, pomatitsa. <laughs> <laughs> I tried putting her recipes together, you know. So they're like staple green cards and we'll get some tape take white pieces of paper and, and, and the recipe was like, you know, a pound or maybe a pound and a half of walnuts, you know, <laughs> and um, maybe one stick or maybe two sticks of margarine. And so they do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had this whole conversation in my head with my mom, you know, <laughs> passed away several years before, and it was just delightful, you know. Finally, I had to call someone at the church to say, how did you do that? <laughs> And we need to make food a ceremony and something that we don't just get in commodity, but that we we enjoy and celebrate, and thus we want the best, not the most, but the best. I think there was a question back here. Grant, did I see you raise your hand? I was going to say, I 
just going to ask how how you saw some of the ecological principles that you've been working on for the last four decades get accepted, incorporated, or not by other judicial or mainstream or whatever agriculture, especially now that you're coming back to the bedroom where you've seen any changes. Yes. So he's asking. Are we seeing in, in traditional agriculture and, and in the Bitterroot where I am and where I farmed previously, are we seeing people starting to utilize more ecological methods? And Grant, I'm really excited actually. I think we're at a teachable moment. We have a, a farm bill coming up, a new farm bill, and one of the things that I and others are working to really push is to make sure that instead of some of the big commodity programs that we've had to encourage some of the big crops like cotton and, and other commodity crops, that we start to put some of our mo a lot more of our money into helping farmers farm better. And one of the things is cover crops. Um, to really incur give farmers incentives and money to keep their soil covered, but the devil's always in the detail. So I've been really excited about this. And, and unfortunately, um, people are getting excited about getting no-till and cover crops into the farm bill, but they're wanting to have that no-till and the cover crops be tilled, not tilled in, but killed off using herbicides. Ah, so cover crops, great, no-till, great, but what are the other ecological relationships that are involved? And of course, you guys know that if we add herbicides to that, that we're affecting, if you kill something, you inherit its job. So yes, Grant, I think um, there are some young farmers at the uh, Hamilton Farmers Market that are asking me about no-till and really want to go to no-till. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think people are thinking a lot about ecosystems and about healthy food and food as medicine, and, and we're, we're asking the questions. We've got a lot of answers and a lot of research that we need to come up with, but I think the questions are starting to be asked. What do you think? Hopeful. Very good. Hope is a great place to end. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank